Hey everyone, and welcome back to Practically Zero Waste, a podcast about making zero waste living as practical as possible. On today's episode, I had the privilege of speaking with Anne-Marie Bonneau, aka the Zero Waste Chef. Anne-Marie's mission has been to cook without sending any packaging to landfill or recycling. Over time, she's got creative with her shopping and has so many different ideas for reducing food waste and cooking from scratch, it's mind-blowing. Plus, she's pretty fun to talk to. So settle in and have a listen to this impressive chef's tips on how to cook waste-free. <laughs> how are you? Oh, fine. Thanks. Thank you so much for wanting to be on an interview with me. Oh, yeah, yeah. Let's get into it. How long have you been living low waste or zero waste? And tell me more about that. Okay, so I've been plastic free since 2011, Mm -hmm. which is pretty much the same as zero waste because everything is plastic. And then a few years later, I went zero waste. So I no longer bought flour and paper bags. Okay. And things like that. Right. You know. What else counts as waste? Does your area recycle glass or anything like that? Oh, so recycling is a last resort. So uh, for me, zero waste is not putting anything in landfill or the recycling bin, ideally. Okay. So when I tell people, when I first went plastic free, I remember a bunch of us at work went out for lunch of somebody's birthday and they my boss started telling everyone oh Emery's got plastic free and one of them said oh you must recycle a lot and I said actually I don't recycle anything because <laughs> I don't buy stuff in packaging right yeah recycling it's not it's not working so well China's not going to take our plastic anymore so we're gonna have this huge mind-bogglingly huge glut of plastic and that we'll have to deal with ourselves. What are we going to do? I don't know. My, um, yeah, so Mary Catherine is finishing up at Guelph, and then she's going to do a certificate program in waste management next year. Amazing. So I think we need a really huge number of people (laughs) working on that. And so I don't know how you get people to do this. I think we need to all slow down. Yeah. Dependent on convenience for our to-go lifestyle. Yeah. And, creates a huge amount of waste and a bit, so I have this long to blog list <laughs> and I whenever I get an idea I put it in there and one is to write a post about that you know the to go versus the to stay lifestyle people don't like to have things taken away from them no they don't like to be told you you can't have your to go coffee cup but I, I think that's the, you know it's the convenience it's convenience that's causing all of this and I know I know some people have to work two or three jobs and they don't have time to but a lot of people do have time yes and I think it's that spend time differently the majority of people would probably actually have the time but then there's the motivation and and a lot of people haven't latched on to that reason why they need to help the environment yet they don't have a personal reason or they haven't got on board with the universal reason to help the environment by any simple actions that they can take and so yeah it's about using your time well in order to make these mindful changes right yeah and then skills too which is kind of what you're teaching is is the ability to make things from scratch and make things package free in a in a society where convenience food is the go-to as opposed to cooking a meal from scratch. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. (laughs) Give people solutions. Yeah. You know, instead of, there's so much bad news out there, you don't have to go far to find bad news. Yeah. (laughs) So I try to provide solutions, like instead of this many, I mean, people need to know the bad stuff. Yeah, they need to know the statistics. Stand, but they also need solutions. You can't just... You you feel helpless when all you read is doom and gloom, and and you don't know where to start. You just feel overwhelmed. Mm-hmm. So practical solutions too. Uh, there's so there's a great book that came out last year, Drawdown by Paul Hawken. Okay. It's, the subtitle is something like the most comprehensive plan ever proposed to reverse climate change. Oh wow. Yeah, and I love this book. So it lists a hundred solutions, ranks them in order of effectiveness and not just slow down climate change but actually reverse it wow and these are things that these tools are already in place yeah we just we need to ramp them up yeah so and the top 10 three of them deal with food okay so one is to stop food waste yeah because you waste all of the resources that went into growing the food but then when food goes to landfill it's so compacted it doesn't break down like it would in compost and so the 
bacteria that break it down, release methane gas, and, and okay. then eat less meat. You know, eat more of a plant-based diet. Yeah. But the what I love about that book is it's it's all solutions based, and they're all things we can do. And there's a lot in there about farming. That's awesome. Still, was another solution, which is when instead of clear cutting the land, you have the animals living in a woodsy area with trees, and their manure helps fertilize the soil and retain water and the yeah. roots. From Trees retain water, and they eat the food that falls from the trees, and it's this closed system. And yeah. Oh, so. I like that. That's cool. That seems like a, a magical, special little world that I would like to live in. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah, they have in Dan Barber's book, The Third Plate, he talks about this area in Spain, De Hesua. Okay. It's this agricultural region. It's, they're raising their food the same way they have been for 2,000 years. Okay. And it's this, yeah, the system where the pigs come in and they eat all the ac acorns and then what's left, the, the ducks get and they're fertilizing everything. And yeah. Yeah, it's just this magical place. I love it. <laughs> Um, I've seen that more and more with small hobby farmers in, in the the area where my parents are from. We're from Peterborough area. Oh, you were? Yeah, so oh, you... My yeah. sister lives in Lindsay. Yeah. Well, near Lindsay, in, near Bob Cajun, really. Yeah. She works in Bob Cajun. Awesome. My, my husband's from just right Where's outside of Lindsay. Oh, okay. Yeah. But a couple of people that we know out there are doing where they have, they'll keep chickens in a coop that's mobile, and so they just move the coop, and so they eat the bugs in the grass, and they get fed, and then they um, are also fertilizing. I mean, it's not nice to walk on your lawn that's covered in chicken poop, but it's fertilizing as you're going, and uh, they shift it every day. Yeah, everything is just kind of kept yep. that way, and I, I think it's just kind of a neat idea. Oh, it's awesome. It's awesome. Yeah, rotational grazing. They move them, and then man, in the omnivorous dilemma, my Paul talks about polyface farms a lot in upstate New York, and it's the same thing. This, oh, I can't think of his name right now. Joel Salatin is the farmer. Yes, that's, the, that's where, or he's the big name behind that idea. Yeah, he's great. So is your dream to live on a farm someday so that you can do all of these things? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So my sister has uh, two and a half acres, maybe, and she has chickens, and when she retires, she's going to get some sheep. Oh, awesome. She had a 120-acre farm. A farm is a lot of work. So now she has this smaller one, and then when she retires, she'll do more. Beautiful. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah <laughs> so that's my dream. I've been talking about that for so long. I don't have to have a huge place. If you had an acre. Yeah, just to have even a small amount of space is all you need to be able to grow any of your own food. So you mentioned your workshops. What, what kind of workshops do you run, and how did those kind of get started? So I first started, uh, uh, my neighbors were guinea pigs. So we have a community kitchen here and I taught sauerkraut workshop in there. I did that a couple of times at least. Mm -hmm. And then I did one on sourdough starter mm -hmm. and, and then I started teaching them to the public. So, and the libraries, the libraries, they'll ask me once in a while, they'll contact me. I do workshops there. So. How do you set up at the library to do a cooking workshop? Do they have a kitchen? Oh, no, you know, I don't need it. So, for sauerkraut, I've done sauerkraut in a park. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did it in San Francisco with the Golden Gate Bridge in the background. <laughs> You don't need electricity. That's one of the things I love about fermentation. Right. For most kombucha, you need electricity. You have to heat up the tea. Yeah, for something like sauerkraut, preserved lemons, fermented chutney, dill pickles, all the all fermented vegetables. Um, wow. You, you just shove food in a jar and uh, <laughs> you know, wait for it to ferment. So for sauerkraut, well, I mean, there's a little more to it, but that's basically it. You, right now I have a couple of workshops. I do kimchi and kombucha, mm -hmm. and then I do a sourdough bread class. Awesome. Yeah, and they're just really small because I do them in my kitchen, which is tiny. Okay. Yeah, and then at the library I've done kombucha a bunch of times. I've done sauerkraut a few times. Oh, and then just zero waste cooking. Mm -hmm. So I've done that a few times where I say, okay, this is how I shop, and I show them my cloth produce bags and my jars, and I explain what I do, and then I say, and then I get home, and this is how I prep my vegetables, and I save the little bits for broth, and then, uh, you know, I'll look through, oh, before I shop, I look through the fridge and see what I have, and then decide what to cook from that, and when I shop, I get other little things I might need. 
Yeah. And then I'll make something like soup, stir fry, the last one I went to. And um, the people, they just devour all the food. I have, <laughs> I bring food samples and I think, wow, does, does no one feed these people? <laughs> they just descend on the food. They eat every, every scrap. Oh, good. So I belong to this zero waste meetup. And when the organizer asked me if I wanted to join, I thought, well, what will we do exactly? Just sit around and drink from our reusable cups. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, we actually do stuff. So I <laughs> organized a cloth produce bag sewing event. So I had people over and we sewed cloth produce bags. And then I went on Instagram and I asked people to send me fabric. So then I had this organized this, with the library's help, this workshop at the library for sewing cloth produce bags. That's great. So people, I said, you know, it's all free, fabric's free. The library has six sewing machines. Oh my gosh, that's so cool. Yeah, yeah. And then other people brought sewing machines. So we cranked out a bunch of bags and I told people, you know, take some home and then, you know, leave a few too. And so we have, now I have a big pile of maybe 300 bags. Yeah. And that's I have, amazing. Yeah, a group of people that I've gotten to know through these meetups and a couple of them are still sewing. So I think they'll bring me a couple hundred more. And then in October at the Sunnyvale Farmer's Market, I'm going to hand them out to people. Okay, good. Yeah, so yes. we'll see how it goes. I, I think people will take the bags. Oh, because yeah. Because last week I was at the Farmer's Market and this guy... Both of us were standing at the dry farm early girl tomatoes. They're these little small tomatoes. They're delicious. They're so good. <laughs> so this guy he was looking for a bag. They had paper bags earlier. They have plastic bags over in another section. And he's looking for a bag. And he said, oh, I don't see any bags. Does anybody see a bag? I need a paper bag. And I said, well, here, I have this extra cloth produce bag you can have. And he said, oh, are you sure? I said, yeah, yeah, it's fine. I have volunteers who make these. We're going to give them out at the Sun and Gale Farmer's Market in yeah. October. And all of a sudden, I had three people standing around asking me, how do you make them? And what a good idea. And I have all this extra fabric, and I'm going to use it to make those. And Oh, I'm so glad. That's wonderful. <laughs> yeah, so I think I think people will take them. Yeah. People also really like free stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's true. So they'll they'll be drawn to the idea of it, and hopefully they'll they'll be able to make it a habit to actually remember to bring them when they're going to well, the market. Well, that's the thing. I take them, but also please use them. Yeah. You mentioned the omnivores dilemma. Um, you, there's that other Michael Pollan book that I I think you've mentioned on Instagram before. Oh or yeah, yeah. Has Eat that... food mostly plants, not too much. Yeah. But that's that? from it. In Defense of Food, which is also fabulous. Yeah. I'm going to make a, a book list recommendation list okay. uh, at the, <laughs> in the notes for all of this because you've got so many good resources that I want to read now. <laughs> They're all great. And so I was wondering if you're vegetarian or if you're vegan or what, what is your kind of... Well, technically I'm an omnivore. Yeah. But I, I rarely eat meat. I won't eat it in a restaurant because I know it came from a CAFO, you know, confined animal feed. Oh, okay. Outrage. So I'm, I'd say almost vegetarian. And I eat, I happen to eat a lot of vegan stuff too. Look, I love Indian food. I just call it all food. Good. I love it's it. Just dinner, you know. I, but I, I like that mentality of just eat well as opposed to you have to adhere to a specific principle. Yeah, but you are, I, right? You're, you're eating well because you're cooking whole food and buying package free and trying to live more sustainably. So yeah, that's your yeah, set of so principles. When I'm, when I'm not plastic free, I have no idea I would improve my diet. Oh, good. But I did. I, I just I just had read about all of the plastic in the oceans and the animals and was so horrified. And I said to my daughter, we have to get off of this stuff. Yeah, stop buying processed food, stop buying snack food. But you can make yeah. them now, right? Like you come up with recipes for crackers oh, and... Wait. Oh, yeah, yeah. The crackers are so good. The sourdough <laughs> crackers, they're really good. And popcorn. We yeah. love popcorn. Yeah, so I just, I eat a lot of whole foods. Do you find that cooking oils are hard to find in bulk at all? Or how do you how do you get around that? Yeah, they are. So there are a few things that are hard to find in bulk. But I happen to live uh, near San Francisco, and there's the bulk heaven. It's called uh, Rainbow <laughs> Grocery. Wow. Yeah, you can get everything. 
Oh, I no mean, way. They don't just have one type of olive oil in bulk. They have several types. Oh, my gosh. Oh, they have everything. Coconut oil, maple syrup. That's tiki, crazy. Miso, uh, tofu. That sounds delightful. Spice. Oh, yeah, yeah. All zero waste people who come to this area, they make the pilgrimage. <laughs> it's a great bowl. They have everything, and it started off in the 70s as, well, it's a co-op, okay. so it's, it started off as part of a commune. People in the commune needed to buy big amounts of food, mm-hmm. so they started buying these huge bulk amounts of food, and they would split the cost among the members, and then it just grew from there into a store. Cool. And they have aisles and aisles and aisles of stuff. <laughs> They have everything. Did you check out a Bulk Barn when you were up in Canada? Oh, yeah. yeah. So my mom's always shopped at Bulk Barn. Yeah, my mom too. She does, yeah, she does a ton of baking, but um, yeah, it really irritated me that you can bring your own jars. But now you can, so that's good. So yeah, yeah my daughter and my sister, they take their own jars and cloth bags to Bulk Barn. Yeah. What advice would you have for someone who maybe doesn't like cooking but wants to be more waste-free? Doesn't like cooking. Doesn't like cooking, I know crazy <laughs> well so my my well this isn't really advice this is just a story <laughs> go on my neighbor lived in a buddhist monastery for a while <laughs> and she said one of the monks living there she noticed that he cooked all the time he's always cooking and she said to him you must really like cooking and he said i really like eating <laughs> <laughs> i like that but sometimes people don't equate those two things right not I now so, well, you don't have to cook anything fancy. I don't cook fancy. Just, I cook simple food. So, like Julia Child said, you don't have to cook masterpieces, just good food from fresh ingredients or something like that. That's nice. Yeah. You know, tonight we're having leftovers. We have, I made pasta earlier in the week. And there's some of that and pest, with pesto. Also, a little bit of planning really helps. Okay. I like to plan a couple of meals in advance. And when you do cook, make extra so that I don't cook every night. That's I good. I don't have time. Yeah. I, so when I do cook, I cook large amounts of food. So learn to love leftovers. Mm-hmm. That's so smart because then you can bring them for your lunches too. And then you don't have to... Yeah, yeah. Buy out. I, I eat leftovers at the office every day. Yeah. It's so cheap. I spend way less money on food now, I think, than I used to. Yeah, that's something else that uh, I'd love to ask about is, do you find that buying less packaged product has led to a lower budget for food? I think so. I haven't yeah. done an, the actual math. <laughs> but I, I, I definitely spend less money, so... A couple of weeks ago, I went to the farmer's market and I rode my bike over to the bank machine. And before I even looked at my purse, I realized, oh, I have no bank card and no money. Oh, my God. And it, was, it was the end of the day, so I couldn't ride home and then ride back. So I went home and I thought, okay, well, what do I have? And I found tons of food. Right. And I would have spent another 60 or 80 bucks on food. But I just made do with what we had, mm-hmm. and we ate, we ate good stuff. I had a bunch of stuff in the freezer. I had a bunch of dried beans. A girl who took my class the day before had brought us, had brought everybody fresh uh, pears. There were a few things my other daughter who had left that week had left behind. So I think when people go grocery shopping, they buy, well, at least, yeah, I, I think people just buy too much food. Yeah, and, and buy a lot of the same food without maybe checking what's in your yeah, yeah, fridge yeah. first. And also buy with really good intentions, like I'm going to eat all this healthy stuff. I'm going to be so healthy this week and buying all sorts of fruit and vegetables because that's the stuff that gets wasted most. So true, yeah, because it's, it's going to go bad the fastest. Yeah. I recommend for people to, when they do go grocery shopping, to then eat according to expiry date. Not like a listed expiry date, but you know that your fresh lettuce is going to wilt faster than your kale or whatever you have in your fridge, right? Or you know the order of things that need to be eaten because this is going to go bad before this is going to go to bad. So if you do buy canned goods or jarred goods or anything like that, then save those for when all of your fresh produce is gone. Don't eat something that's, yeah. Yeah, in the right yeah, order. yeah, yeah, that's really smart. Yeah, and you'll save money. Who yeah. doesn't like to save money? I think that that should be more widely advertised. I think, why do, why do people think that zero waste is more expensive? Because I'm sure there are different parts that have a higher price tag. Yeah, yeah, there are some things. So some ingredients I buy are more expensive. So you asked about the oil. Yeah. And I think, depending on the store, bulk olive oil, mm-hmm. 
expensive than than packaged. Mm -hmm. Some things are more expensive. Most things are are aren't though. Bulk tea, I think, is less expensive. Bulk yeah. flour. I'm always amazed when I buy a big jar of flour. And cashier yeah. rings me up and says, that, and I noticed it was you know three dollars and twelve cents for a big jar. So I I do I hear that complaint too all the time. Like oh, privileged women started this. Here that, that I know there are those. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how eliminating bottled water is elitist, unless you live in Flint. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if if fresh drinking water does not come from your tap, then no one is holding bottled water against you. But if right. you have drinkable water that comes from your tap, then there is no reason for you to be buying bottled water. Right, right. Then drink that instead of soda. Yeah. <laughs> so or make your own if you go to your blog and learn how to make your own ginger oh yeah bag. yeah i finished off the lime i made carbonated limeade it was so good <laughs> it was fantastic i really really want to try that and i don't know oh, what's stopping okay. me <laughs> i'm gonna do that today after after we finish our yeah, interview <laughs> start a ginger bug so another thing that you've made from scratch is vanilla extract like pure vanilla extract not the artificial Stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah. Where do you get a vanilla bean in so, bulk? So, the stores keep changing. So, oh, okay. Whole, Whole Foods used to have it in bulk. Sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. Okay. The batch that I have going now, I'm pretty sure I bought those vanilla beans at Whole Foods. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm not sure what I'll do when, when I'm out. Okay. I'm bulk barn sure does not bulk. carry them. They yeah, carry they're, they're, vanilla bean paste, but I think it comes in a in a jar, like it's a packaged thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I went to the Caribbean once, and it didn't look like a farm, but it was a farm. The woman who owned it was, was growing food all over the place, and she gave me vanilla beans. And then you so, just soak them in vodka. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you just, the way I make them is I cut them, but I leave them attached at the top. And yeah. then just put it, I put three in a cup of vodka in a jar, or you can use rum. Let it sit for a couple of months, shake it once in a while when you think of it. The bash that I have now, it's at least six months old. Yeah. It's really, really good. Oh, good. Yeah. And My daughter Do you strain it? And do you then strain it and use it? Or do you just keep taking from I, that jar and adding to that jar? You can take the, the vanilla beans from the old jar. You can make another jar, but it won't be as strong. And I don't strain it because I like having the little seeds. Store-bought vanilla extract's good. It's just, it's always in little, here anyway, it's often in little plastic bottles and it costs a fortune. It's so expensive. Yeah, yeah, and it's, it's, it's going up. And it's so easy to make. Mm -hmm. Well, you just, you have to wait. That's the only thing. You have to time it. So when you see you're getting low, you have to start a new batch. Because right. you have to months before it's ready. <laughs> but it's way cheaper. That's it, too, is that there's going to be... Some things that cost more upfront or cost more every time you buy them, but then there will be tons of other things that you're saving money on. And so that variety or that balance is how zero waste is possible. Because if it was exorbitantly expensive, then not enough people would be able to do it. But because there's so many different levels that you can approach it from, it's easier to say that it's not as expensive as people think. Right. So my daughter, she actually wrote a blog post on her blog about how she couldn't afford to be plastic free okay. at, at school because she said no, a pound of rice at no frills was cheaper than a pound in bulk. But what she does what she can, yeah. which is actually a lot. Yeah. You know, there's stuff you can do. You don't have to feel helpless. And yeah. I feel if I'm doing something, I feel better. Yeah, and if you're looking for a way to to be active and, and to get up and do something for the planet and for your community and for your own body and for your family, then zero waste is a really good place to start. Yeah, yeah. and you can you know, just do what you can. That's another piece of advice. Don't try to do everything at once. It's yeah. too overwhelming. Yeah. Start with something like eliminate bottled drinks like soda and water and energy drinks. That's a good spot. Number one, that's healthier for you to begin with and immediately better for the planet. Yeah, so some, start with something easy and then once you have that down, try something else. Like, yeah. uh, well, look for unpackaged fruit and vegetables at the store. Yeah. And then maybe after that, visit your farmer's market. <laughs> I love it. I love the progression. <laughs> yeah, and then once you get started, you can't stop. <laughs> 
<laughs> I think, yeah, because you just suddenly become aware of all of the, all of the issues and get overwhelmed and then rein it in and then take things one at a time, but you're still hypersensitive to all of the garbage that's around you. Yeah, it's everywhere. What are some other interesting ways to use up food scraps? I think there was a TV show called oh. Scraps. Yeah, mm. yeah. Yeah, there's all sorts of stuff you can do. So, well, vegetable scraps, those are great for broth. Mm -hmm. A couple of weeks ago, I made soup and it called for broth, and I just made some broth. Right now, I have a big jar of apple scrap vinegar. So How do you do that? I cannot. I haven't bought vinegar for five or six years, probably. <laughs> and this stuff's free. Yeah. I made beet pickles recently. I love beet pickles. Okay. So you just roast beets and then peel them and slice them and then pour on top of vinegar or sugar or mixture. Yeah. Oh, dill, if you have dill. So I just used my scrap vinegar. It was really strong. They were delicious. That's great. Yeah, I love making that stuff. And I use it to clean and I use it on my hair. That week I forgot my money at the farmer's market. I was looking through and I my freezer and I found frozen lime juice that I used to make my limeade. Okay. So before I went to Canada on my trip, I had a bunch of limes. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh no, those are gonna, those are gonna shrivel up by the time we get back. And so the night before, I cut them in half and squeezed the juice out and froze it. Yeah. And in the old days, I would have just composted that stuff. I probably would have just left it or, and then come home and seen that they were bad and composted them. Yeah. Just thinking ahead. I think it was actually Trashes for Tossers was saying, before you leave on a trip, go through your fridge and see what's going to go bad and make sure that you either use it up and freeze it or figure out a different way to preserve it or give it away or anything like that, just so that you're not wasting that food. Long, a long time ago, before I started this, I remember giving stuff away, <laughs> giving food away to people all the yeah. time. I'm leaving, eat this. <laughs> you also freeze lemon zest. What do you use all your lemon zest for? I'll just toss a little bit into something that I'm baking. Mm -hmm. Pancakes. Oh. Put them in my pancakes. Or recipes like, I have a recipe uh, for lemon loaf. Mm -hmm. And that calls for a bunch of lemon zest. It adds some flavor to baking. Do you ever get overwhelmed with the amount of food scraps that you are saving? Like, how do you make sure that you're using everything and yeah so i don't use them all okay I, I can't i can't zest every single lemon or lime yeah that i go through so i just compost yeah some of and do you have a backyard compost or is there municipal composting in your area so where i live we have just backyard compost yeah i also had a compost pile in my yard because the person who used to run our compost here he was really strict and he wouldn't let us put a lot of stuff in it <laughs> like avocado skins you didn't let us put them in I thought, why they break down uh, so i started my own pile in my yard and all i did was <laughs> rip all the stuff on in the corner of my yard and then i would put leaves on it and then i would put another pile and it worked really well oh good i always wish that i had some sort of pulverizer or something that i could just run a bunch of large food scraps through so that it's already chopped up super fine like a food processor that was really intense and could handle like the top of a or the skins of a pineapple or oh, yeah. like banana peels i just picture that taking less time if it was chopped up small but i don't want to chop yeah, up my compost i wish there was some sort of attachment i could get for a <laughs> yeah like a, a food chipper instead yeah. of a wood chipper oh maybe i could just use a wood chipper <laughs> maybe yeah that'd be smelly after a little while <laughs> well if you do it right though it doesn't smell compost doesn't smell at all well i guess your wood chipper yeah the wood yeah. chipper just right, baked right, on right, right. hot in you the sun close it down. yeah <laughs> Okay, big plans for when I own my hobby farm in the in the future. And where can people find you online? Uh, so my blog is zerowastechef.com. Mm -hmm. And I'm on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter. They're all at Zero Waste Chef. The thing about Zero Waste, unlike other blogs, at least for me, is there's no return on investment. <laughs> so with other blogs, you know, I get, I get a good amount of traffic on, on my blog and on Instagram. I could sell stuff. Right? I could do sponsored posts. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. But I can't tell people, don't buy anything. Oh, except for this, because I'll get a cut if you buy it. Exactly. Oh, I know. I love, I love that all these zero-waste shops and package-free shops are popping up and exist. But at the same time, they're just creating a new kind of consumerism, and it drives me nuts. 
I know. <laughs> you just I like, know. I mean, you do need some stuff. You do, and it's and it's important that those things exist. But I think that when you're starting out as zero waste, you think that's the only thing that exists, and you don't start with what's already in your house. Right, mm-hmm. right. Yep, I remember. So Mary Cat won't like me saying this, but she was only sixteen when we started. Yeah. And she kept saying, "Oh, we need to buy this. We need to buy this." And I finally said to her, "Mary Cat, we can't shop our way out of global warming." <laughs> You use the stuff you have first. Yeah. yeah, first. And then after a while, if you see that there's a need for something, then definitely. Uh... Yeah, you do need a bamboo toothbrush. Yeah. <laughs> Cloth pads. I sold them years, actually years ago. Yeah, before, did... before it was cool. Yeah, yeah, because I'm super frugal. So I sold Brilliant. a pile of them. <laughs> and my even my here in Northern California, my friends, some of them thought that was really gross. <laughs> Yeah, I think that um, if you want to be eco-friendlier, then you're going to become acquainted with a lot of things that might gross you out otherwise. That's because this convenience culture has like very cleanly done away with everything that has grossed us out in the past. Yep. Like yep, yep, yep. using a handkerchief, we just throw away everything, right? Yep. Instead of having to deal with maybe a damp piece of cloth that you're blowing your face into. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and cloth diapers, anything reusable anything at all <laughs> you just yep, yep. Gotta become intimately acquainted with your waste and uh it's all worth it if you have a good reason why that you're doing all this then it's all worth it oh yeah well when mary cat was born in hamilton mm-hmm. at st joseph's hospital mm-hmm. they used cloth diapers what yep no way i want to have yep. my baby in hamilton thanks so much for wanting to talk with me today i think that we've covered just such a wide variety of things it's awesome <laughs> it's gonna be yeah, so well, much thank fun. you Thanks again for listening, everyone. If you'd like to see a list of Anne Marie's book recommendations, you can find that in the description below. Head over to her blog, zerowastechef.com, for plenty of inspiration for living and cooking zero waste, and find her on Instagram at zerowastechef. You can find me on Instagram at Elspeth Callahan, and find past episodes of this podcast on SoundCloud and YouTube. Links in the description below. Have an excellent week, everyone, and good luck with your adventures in zero waste.